Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Cambius. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I was supposed to be up there pacing around, uh, but apparently I'm too tall for the camera. Uh, so I get this little stool and podium set up. Uh, I'm Robert Cambius, and for the past couple months, I've been working on a capstone project, a short film tentatively titled A Long Walk in the Cold. Today, I want to talk about my project, my successes and my failures, uh, but more importantly, the pitfalls and problems I ran into uh, thanks to doing this whole thing during the reign of COVID-19. I think this works. Oh, is that me blocking? Possibly. There we go. Uh, the initial project was significantly different from what came uh, from what came out of it, uh, thanks almost entirely to COVID-19 messing with all of my plans. Uh, the initial project, which uh, I apologize to Zoom people, you don't get my cool little laser, but for people in the audience, uh, you'll be able to see. The original project was a simple, with heavy quotation marks, uh, short film starring two to three actors, a couple extras, and telling the story of Isaac, uh, an amateur journalist from a war-torn country, watching uh, his journey out of that war-torn country, uh, the people he encounters, the difficulties he overcomes. You know, I had planned a one-month period of intensive shooting through April, uh, and almost immediately after coming up with the initial idea, I was planning so much stuff. I had multiple speaking roles. I was talking to people at NCTV about complicating lighting setups and cinematography setups, tons of dialogue, complicated scenes, a church for some reason, action and battle scenes, and even some pyrotechnics if I got lucky. And I was so excited for this project uh, and what it would bring uh, that as soon as I finished writing, I pushed out uh, a casting call, a big uh, just shout to the world to come and act in this film uh, and give me those actors. And nobody responded. <laughs> nobody, absolutely nobody. It's completely empty. Um, not a soul. In retrospect, in retrospect, <laughs> it was probably reasonable to assume that not many people, especially actors, would be interested in working on a student film for no money in the middle of a global pandemic. But at the time, I was panicking. I was panicking because I had no actors and my shooting schedule was dangerously close with now basically nothing prepared. Uh, so it was time to completely revamp the project. I needed to completely revamp the film without actors. I needed to somehow tell the story I had uh, Notes, notes. Somehow tell the story I had with one camera and an amateur voice actor, myself, uh, throw out basically everything that required or even had another actor in it um, and rework basically the entire script and screenplay and all the additional stuff you get in between, like storyboards and cut and spacing and all that and blocking. The kicker was that I had to do all of this in one week. <laughs> Uh, as I was scheduled to start shooting the first week of April. In the end, I didn't actually start shooting the first week of April because that was an unreasonable workload to try and get done. Um, and luckily, I was not alone. And after bouncing off ideas off of my lovely capstone advisor here in our meetings and uh, as well as friends and family, uh, I developed the following solutions to my problem. Instead of trying to preserve the old script, I basically threw everything out and started from the basics, leaning into elements I had been completely avoiding before. The war became the main focus. The war became the main focus rather than the journey in itself. Uh, and the film itself became more of a found footage documentary, um, abandoning this idea of doing proper scenes and uh, blocking and stuff, and instead doing a first person found footage documentary type deal, like what you see with like Blair Witch Project. Uh, thanks to having only one person, the locations uh, needed then needed to basically become their own characters. And 
uh, pieces in themselves. So I had to pay very close attention to which bits of forests and fields uh, I was traveling out to and wandering around with a camera uh, to make sure that it would be interesting to look at since the characters would become, for the most part, um, basically completely unseen. And that's the last bit there. The characters were, well, not present. The only people I had were myself to be on camera and maybe a couple voice actors. So really the only, the entire idea of character on-screen characters had to be kind of abandoned. And so after a week of reinventing my entire script uh, and writing down my cinematography and plan shots on scrap paper and uh, bits of uh, napkin instead of any proper actual storyboard, uh, I took to shooting. And almost two months later, here I am uh, with a fresh haircut after maintaining hair continuity for a month uh, and a pile of footage, which now needs to be edited. Uh, the hair continuity was fun. I didn't get a haircut for almost two months. I don't know how many of you were on my Zoom classes, but you might remember how shaggy I was getting. Anyway, now I wanted to do this section uh, as a live edit where I edit a piece of material uh, from the film on the fly. Uh, I thought it would be a fun way uh, to show my thought process live and talk with you guys and the people on Zoom uh, about the process of editing because in the grand scheme, editing is really my passion. That's why I did this project because I really enjoy editing the process of editing and all the problem solving inside of that, not just you know the prospect of making a film. And after careful calculations, I concluded that that presentation would only take a mere five hours. But I'm sure that if I use pre-built templates and stuff, uh, surely that would cut the time down a bit. It's longer, it's longer, okay. So no live edit. Instead, uh, a walkthrough of sorts, uh, an abridged version showing all the cool stuff and none of the boring bits. First of all, we import our footage. Uh, for the scene I edited for this presentation, I am making a montage section uh, that will most likely come at the end of the film, if not the uh, very end in the final edit. Uh, for this, we are taking footage uh, from uh, footage that I shot rather wandering around Western Mass and combining it with some real life war footage, real combat footage gathered from actual war zones. Turn. Oop. Yeah, there we go. Uh, the second step is to trim everything down to only the good stuff. In most video, the good stuff is actually about a third of what you shoot. Two thirds of it can just get thrown out immediately. Um, and so the goal when filming in the field, especially, um, and especially when doing stuff like this on your own, uh, is to gather sufficient footage uh, so that the good stuff is still a workable amount. You can see uh, around here towards the end where it gets really choppy that uh, there was a little bit less good stuff to work with than uh, in the rest. Uh, for here, we have shots from three locations, uh, a dirt road, uh, at the end there, a middle of a middle of some woods and forest uh, for the middle, and uh, at the beginning there, a vineyard, which uh, I just wandered through. Now that all of our footage is arranged, we move on to step three and add the war footage. I am using real life combat footage uh, from Donbass, Ukraine, the current war in Donbass, Ukraine. I chose footage of this conflict uh, for two main reasons. Firstly, the conflict is modern, which means that uh, the equipment and the houses and everything that you will see in that footage matches the technology that you and just sort of general visuals that you will see in my own footage. So you have that sort of continuity um, internally consistent in there without having to go in and edit out everything that didn't exist in the mid 80s or whatever. Um, and reason two, very much connected with that, the Donbass region of Ukraine has roughly the same climate uh, as uh, the Northeastern United States. So both my footage and the war footage will match, uh, which makes for a very, uh, again, a much more realistic continuity uh, and much more realistic scene as it actually looks like the same place. Um, here you can see me slotting in voiceover and uh, and other audio. Uh, before I recorded my serious script, 
uh, I used dummy tracks with roughly the same length uh, so that I could cut the scenes uh, and basically have all the keying and uh, uh, plan everything out before I actually had to go and record my proper takes. Um, I don't actually remember which ones, uh, whether the dummy tracks or the real tracks are the ones in the screenshot. So either those are me reading dramatically into a microphone or they are me reading dramatically into the like, microphone reading the Lorax. Okay. Uh, and the final step, we add background effects or Foley. This is used to give my footage roughly the same background noise uh, as the war footage, which mainly involves a lot of muffled gunshots and machine gun fire uh, and other battle, which you can see under my footage uh, here and here and a little bit there, the cyan colored. And with that and some fine tuning, the product is done. Let's see what it looks like. Anybody else? We're going to plug in this. I also apologize to Zoom people because it's going to get laggy. As spring turned to summer, the rains came and I picked up my Okay, hang on. So, oh, the sound should be coming from here, not from there. So, just a moment, everyone. Um, that amp is on, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that's all the way up. I'm sure that's all the way up. Sound uh, should not be coming out of here. How you folks doing? Yeah. You're welcome. Let's try this again. I pace northeast towards the. All right, we're going to try one more thing. In fact, we're going to do something. I'm going to stop the share and start it again. First thing we're going to do is make sure this sounds all the way up. All right, we're going to start the share screen again. We're going to make sure we're sharing sound. And go with that. All right, let's hope for the best, folks. As spring turned to summer, the rains uh, came. Hmm. Well, we'll have to have the sound come out of here, folks. That's all there's going to be to it. Let's try that. As spring turned to summer, the rains came, and I picked up my pace northeast towards the border, moving through farm and forest. Little did I know that further south, the rebels' spring offensive was beginning. The next two weeks would be marked by bloodshed and violence between the rebels and their government enemies. And up in the north, I was completely unaware. While I walked through vineyards and dodged patrols, militias clashed in city streets only a dozen miles from my path. The only sign of it, the occasional distant gunfire or sound of helicopter or truck. The war was all around me, and yet I did not see it or even know its true scale. That was the scariest part. After the two weeks had passed, I knew I was close. I could feel it, even as my GPS and camera ran low on batteries. In the northern forests, the gunfire became a distant drumbeat, a drumbeat to march by as I picked my way through trees and through bushes.
Офигенно. Ох, красавцы. I couldn't understand the destruction behind that drum beat. How could I? The war was so distant, the trails of smoke and fire no longer visible in the sky. At least, not from where I stood. One day, I stepped across the border somewhere in these vast woods. I didn't know until almost a full day later. Nobody told me I was safe, and the gunfire never stopped. Get it? Okay. Thank you, Robert. How much time do we have left? All right, I've got three minutes for questions. Good time for questions. If anyone has questions for Robert, uh, if you're online, you can put your questions in the chat and I will read them out for you. Okay. Any questions? Uh, of this process, my favorite part of this process, definitely the editing part. That is the most fun for me because uh, it just has everything, all of the pain from filming and uh, dealing with um, pre-production um, as well as just gone and you can just focus on actually making the final product. Yeah, I like film and I really enjoy editing and I want to do this as a career. Always really good. Thank you. Any questions from the online group? Um, let me just check the chat. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out if the sound is reaching the outline group. Um, ah, here you go. So the first question uh, for Mr. Selfridge is, why did you choose to make a war film? It's actually a good question. This is kind of a story. It's a good question as why did I choose to make a war film? Uh, it, it's been sort of a story that's been bouncing around in the back of my head for a little bit now, just from, I don't really know where it came from. Uh, just this idea of someone who is completely helpless to actually do anything about the war and seeing their perspective, because I feel like that's something that isn't done very often, um, or at least is done in much more of the, uh, and now we're going to sit in a bunker for five years and uh, do nothing but talk to each other. So I want to tell a story where someone is doing is actively doing something to safeguard their own self, but isn't able to like participate in a larger war. Yeah, there's another aspect of it that I really liked, which is that your storyline allows you to make your character a witness. And so what we're really seeing are we're seeing someone that we can relate to in the story, right? The person who's telling the story. So we're <clears throat> as audience empathizing with that storyteller. But then we get to see through that character's eyes. Um, and, then, and this brings up the next question from the chat, um, because uh, there was a, an interesting fellow, someone named James Cambius, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, he said, did you wind up doing any scenes with yourself in them? Yes, uh, there are two scenes, um, which were not in this montage, but um, which are basically standalone themselves, uh, where um, one where the character Isaac, who I play, um, is talking to Cameron, basically explaining everything. And that's right at the beginning, that's mm -hmm. right before he leaves. Um, uh, and then there's a second part where he's pinned down and talking to camera, and there is like bullets whizzing over his head, and he's just found a safe place oh, and cool. sitting there. Yeah. Yeah. And those are, but those are really the only two where um, I'm actually on camera. Right. Else is One of the reflections I had was if we could even find you a flipping camera person, it would allow us to have shots of your character walking through this environment. And the classic matchup in the film of close ups of you looking, right, and reacting to something and then cutting to the shot. And that would have been really interesting for you. That, and that still can be really interesting for you to try to get eyeline match shots so that your eyeline matches the 
more footage you have so that that and then when we put you in this environment and get the right eye line that will really the audience will really feel that you are in that environment i did a couple of shots like that where when he's pinned down yeah great cool that that i think that's what i that that's the thing that the way you work with this story affords um and i and I, so i was really fascinated by the way you were able to match up the footage in terms of environment right um and so so much of what your project here was about was matching things getting things to match and work with each other and that's a huge challenge right getting getting the found footage you have to fit into the world of what you're filming so i, I thought that was really exemplary well we have run out of time uh i want a big thank you to uh robert Camus from everyone thank you so much robert thank you and thank you to people in zoom for tuning in We must. We're moving on, folks, to the next. Uh, there's a question for all of us to reflect on for Mr. Selfridge. Uh, did your study of existentialism influence your approach to the making of this film, especially with respect to the creation of your solitary hero? And I think that's something for all of us to reflect on. Yes? As, as we move into the next one. In just a few minutes, Jasper Fletcher will be uh, starting his Capstone presentation. Take a short break. Thank you all. <laughs>